but begins the website with an extremely interesting, um, almost, it's, a, it's a, a click you almost can't make, which connects the whole story of companion animals to species survival plans and endangered species discourse. So that virtually the first site you're led to move through to the rest of the website puts you in the company of um, the endangered tigers of South Asia. Uh, and the species survival plans that are put together out of international consortia of experts, including pedigree software designers, um, various kinds of zoological and aquarium association groups internationally, um, various international bodies for the monitoring of endangered species protection, NGOs of various types, and the development of plans to produce a certain kind of, I think, again, under the rubric of emergent ontology, a certain kind of uh, techno-scientific population that has not existed on this planet before, that is the protected population that is composed of all of the collectible genetic diversity of a species or subspecies collected and, and preserved through breeding practices in such a way as to allow a agreed upon percent of available genetic diversity to exist at least 100 or 200 years. It's an extremely interesting selection it, um, practice. If Onco Mouse emerges out of a selection practice in the laboratory that makes the laboratory its natural habitat, if that is its scene of birth, okay, the scene of birth of the endangered species is this um, uh, collaborationist, uh, inter the scene of interdisciplinarities and crosstalk among various communities of practice that define a proper population according to selection criteria that could not exist in any other ecology. To, to collect together and propagate X percentage, say 90% of all available genetic heterogeneity in extant populations for such and such a length of time selects not for health, not for function, not for beauty, not for anything except diversity itself. The preservation of diversity itself becomes the kind of, of uh, hyper-modern selection criterion, uh, where diversity is both, I think of diversity as like the gold standard of the 19th century. It is understood that diversity is the motor of wealth and that which must be proliferated, contained, and distributed. It is understood that diversity accumulation is the name of contemporary is the name of the game in contemporary capital. Okay. Uh, I think of species survival plans and the discourses of endangered species very much within that idiom, and within and within that idiom or that ecology, the materialization of diversity, for example, in the form of an endangered species, is an extremely interesting material semiotic act. Dogs then referred to endangered breeds, the, the specific uh, dog breeds protected by the kennel clubs or threatened by the kennel clubs, depending on your, your perspective. The closed stud books and breeding practices of the specialized breeds referred to endangered species practices produce a very interesting ontological move in terms of who dogs are, not as pets but as endangered species, okay. uh, preserved and propagated for diversity itself as the value. Second area I want to call your attention to is the online distance learning course on canine genetics offered by the Cornell University Veterinary School, which I took last summer, both as a student and an ethnographer. Um, it was a wonderful course. Uh, the uh, level of passion from the lay breeders, many of them with 30 years of breeding in Wheaton Terriers, 25 years of breeding in uh, livestock guardian dogs, uh, the Great Pyrenees, um, you know, a person who had bred boxers for 10 years and got out of the breed because of the problem of genetic disease and her particular lines, et cetera. A, a, an extraordinary uh, kind of experience of the students in this class and the veterinary school geneticists, a course that was organized by a meat animal geneticist, a population geneticist who worked on meat production animals, which has much more money in it than dogs, <laughs> vastly more important. Uh, than the pet industry. Although the pet industry is a, is a big industry, the meat industry is much bigger, and there are very much bigger stakes um, in the genetics of, the, of um, meat animal breeds. <laughs> okay. uh, John Pollock uh, also consults with seeing eye dog breeders for maintaining genetic health in the very heavy selection criteria of seeing eye dog, uh, put, uh, so that pu more puppies are successful in seeing eye dog education and fewer puppies flunk out and go to pet homes. 
uh, maximizing the number of successful mm -hmm. dogs, uh, which becomes an issue in the hearing dog therapy world, in the service dog world in general, in the search and rescue dog breeding. Um, dogs are finding jobs of many kinds. It is, in addition to saving a genetic life, in case you don't know it, it is also incumbent on you to fulfill the species potential of your companion animal, that you need to provide those sorts of activities that allow full coming into being. Aristotle would be very happy um, <laughs> today, uh, assuming that Aristotle was, I think of Aristotle maybe as the funder of the Misiplicity Project. That's why his name can't be revealed. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. The third internet site is Canjan L, a list, where the pedagogical model of both the website and the vet school course break down. While I found fascinating crosstalk and, and um, in interaction between different communities of expertise, usually called scientific and lay, there's challenges to each other's standards of evidence, what counts as a fact is a line, a population, the way words appear to mean the same thing but don't as you watch them uh, in practice, the way the word population means different things to different users. At the list site, all of it is truly up for grabs in, in the interesting ways that the sociality of websites is being studied in several domains. In the interest of time, I'm not going to say too much more about Kanjan except to say that the pedagogical model breaks down thoroughly here and we see contestations for what's going to count as a fact. Uh, debates about standards of evidence, uh, what kind of credibility is managed by whom, who can manage who else's credibility, when do you post into the void, what kinds of, of posts get picked up and by whom. You can watch um, as other people who have done quasi-ethnographic work on net sociality, uh, the emergence of discursive communities of considerable complexity um, over a period of time in this, um, in this scene. But I want to end the lecture uh, with a, another set of illustrations of contemporary companion species um, ecology and behavior, which is uh, to pay attention to uh, what I'm calling alpha bitches online. <laughs> now, it is a term of great respect to call somebody an alpha bitch in the dog world. Um, of, of a human being of either uh, of, uh, uh, any of the available genders, more than two but not many uh, available <laughs> genders in our species, uh, can become an alpha bitch, although there is, I think, a greater access to that label for persons of the female persuasion. Uh, sorry about that, but it just really is true, and I thought you probably should know that. Uh, <laughs> among the alpha bitches that I have interviewed, um, Truly, the dog world is full of formidable women. I have never felt so, so unable to cope uh, <laughs> in the face of these um, uh, quite scary people <laughs> who um, deploy their authority. Uh, a remark, I dare a dog to misbehave in the presence of these women. These are women who, uh, the dog world is, um, the cultures that, that I have been looking at, partially to my surprise, have been heavily populated by women over 50. It's a really interesting um, age gender breakdown. Uh, plenty of other people there, but there's a strong kind of um, leadership core uh, by women of a certain age, uh, which I also am pleased by, uh, because that is not typical of, of communities of authoritative practice in the cultures we're used to describing. Um, Two women I want to talk about in a contrastive way to illustrate these sorts of um, lay action that both incorporates and challenges and redefine what counts as good enough science. One of them in the Australian Shepherd breed, a woman named C.A. Sharp, who got, you will immediately identify with her because she got her BA in radio, television, and film, has no formal genetics education, works as an accountant to make money, was a breeder of Australian Shepherds uh, who have nothing to do with Australia. They're actually U.S. Western ranch dogs. Uh, the only reason they're called Australian is a connection through Basque sheep herders who also immigrated to Australia in the same period. Long story. Uh, the Western U.S. ranch dogs. <laughs> uh, C.A. Sharp, as a, an activist in the breed, um, and as a lay activist, publishes the Double Helix Network News that organizes the, uh, the breed interest in genetic health and disease issues. She and a friend organized a series of test breedings around a certain eye disease that um, she was quite certain Australian shepherds were subject to, but which veterinarians and geneticists denied that these, these dogs got. So that she and another lay friend designed the breedings, uh, designed an excellent